Hey chicas, how's everyone doing? Welcome back. So today we're going to be working with this design and of course a new true crime story. So these are all the products I'm going to be using for today's video you guys. These products you can find them on my online store. The link will be in the description box below except for this one because this one is from Jacqueline Costa and this is just a hollow gold which is beautiful. But okay, you guys, so I'm going to begin here by telling you the story. Today's true crime story is about David Leonard Wood. He was a serial killer here in my city of El Paso, Texas, back in the 80s. And nobody has ever done his story before. Um, so, of course, I have to put this name out there of this person. So, I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit of his backstory. Um, and David Leonard Wood was born in June 20th, 1957. He was from San Angelo, Texas, which is not too far from El Paso. It is maybe, I would probably say about six to seven hours from El Paso. Um, he later on came to El Paso. I'm not too sure how he even, um, eventually came to live in El Paso. I'm not too sure how he ended up here. I tried to do the best research that I could, but I couldn't find any info on that. So his life was marked by constant fights between his parents. Um, they were constantly fighting. His father would punish him with a paddle. You know, you guys, that back in the day, that was a punishment even at schools. Teachers would be able to punish you with a paddle, so I guess his father pretty much overdid it. And his mother suffered from mental illness, okay? She she was just mentally ill. His, his parents were pretty young when they married. His father, Leo, was 20 years old, and his mother, Betty, was 16 at the time. So they were very young. They were very, very young. And uh, one year after their marriage, they had their first daughter, Debbie. And within the next six years, they welcomed three more children, which included David, which he was the second oldest. So David and his siblings often were sent to live at foster homes because of their parents' constant fights, like I said. They were always constantly fighting, so I guess CPS was called on them or something, and the children got taken away, and, you know, they ended up at foster houses all the time, you guys. So they were constantly just um, at foster homes. David's mother was often under psychiatrists and doctors. She was institutionalized a total of six months in a mental hospital and she would actually receive electroconvulsive shock treatments and her treatment with prescription drugs was a never-ending story she was pretty much all the time under medication she was constantly taking medications she was just pretty much all the time under meds you know there was not once that David recalls her mom being just normal. She was all the time under medications, you know. And due to this, you know, his 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 mom's response to love towards her children was just not there, you know, due to her mental illness, due to her always being under medication. The motherly love was just not there. So David's parents eventually divorced. They remarried each other, then they divorced one more time, and then soon they both remarried, but to different people. So, David's school records show that there was a very poor academic achievement. He flunked first grade, third grade, and ninth grade. You know, you know how kids are. Kids can be very cruel, very... Kids can be very mean, you guys. So there was a lot of bullying. And after his second semester of his second attempt of ninth grade, he was 17 years old by this time, and he decided to drop out. So Wood later on was given six IQ tests between the ages 
of 19 and 50, 54 years of age. And his scores were in order from 111, which he did pretty good. I mean, he it wasn't bad at all. And then he went down to a 64, 71, 101, 67, and 57. The first score was in 1977, and the most recent score was in 2011, which was a 57. So that was very low, you guys. His last IQ test was very low. Like I said, it was a 57. So fast forward to 1977. David was sentenced to five years in prison after pleading guilty to indecency with a child, which had happened back uh, in August of 1976. David was convicted of a 19 year old woman and a 13 year old girl he pleaded guilty on june 19 of 1980 and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison which he only served seven years in huntsville texas prison which pretty much that was just a slap on the hand i mean what i'm about to tell you guys if he wouldn't have gotten out of prison because of those two um convictions that he had gotten none of this would have ever happened so they let him out and after his release he came back to El Paso in 1981 the remains of two young girls were found in two separate shallow graves in the desert of northeast El Paso an El Paso water utilities worker had been working and he actually found the graves during you know his work shift and um, the other graves were later found during the next few months as police and volunteers searched the area by foot and helicopter. So there are three girls that have not been found, you guys. Honestly, that really makes me so mad. Um, but there's three girls up to right now that ha their bodies have not been found. Their families, their parents, their moms, their dads, they don't know anything about these three other girls. And um, it's, it's believed that it can be David since they had some type of connection with him or they were actually last seen with him. Um, but yeah, it's pretty sad that there has not been nothing found or, you know, he doesn't want to say anything. But anyway, we'll get to that on later. And they also said that one of the girls had been dead longer than the other one because of how decomposed the body was so the bodies were found in graves of two feet deep and 50 feet apart from each other and this was about a mile from macomb's street so police lieutenant paul salcedo said that at the time they had no suspects no leads but three women had been reported missing around the area in the last two months so they contacted all the families you know to see if I guess to kind of come and see any belongings from the bodies that had been recovered to see if you know they they noticed anything that was familiar to them or that can help them identify the bodies so you know they were just contacting families that had reported missing daughters so by this point, they have many mothers calling like, hey, where's my daughter? Where's my daughter? Where's my daughter? My daughter's missing. My daughter's missing. Uh, so they have many calls now from these mothers that had reported their daughter's missing. So, um, you know, they they were just hoping for an answer. And, and now the case have has been transferred from police to the Crime Against Persons Divisions in El Paso. And in October of 1987, two more bodies were found. And yes, you guessed it, they found the bodies in the desert. So now at this point, they're thinking that a serial killer might be, you know, on the loose, just roaming the area. Because in a six-week period, now they have four bodies, you know. So the bodies were found in a one-mile radius from the macomb street which is about 18 miles east of downtown so police don't want to alarm residents and decide to not you know comment about questions asked if there was any type and sort of connection between the bodies 
so you know they just decide to not comment about it and just decide to tell the, the residents don't panic like come on who's not gonna panic you guys i mean there are now people taking precautions no one's walking outside families you know they're not letting their daughters out at night they're just literally locking their doors windows anything they can to keep themselves protected because they honestly don't know there's been four bodies found now all women you know they don't know what's up they don't know what's going on they want to take precautions and cops you know police don't want to talk about it and you know police just decide to don't panic like come on who's not gonna panic so yeah by this point two of the four bodies have been already identified and they've already identified two of the bodies they contacted their families you know they already know who they are so now it's the end of october in 1987 and marcia whitley receives the call that she most feared her 15 year old daughter desiree was dead so she was actually the third body found Desiree Wheatley was a 15-year-old middle schooler. She was at a friend's house celebrating their middle school graduation. You know how it is. It's the end of the school year. It's your, you know, your graduation. And you just want to go and celebrate. You're young. So, you know, I don't know if kids still do this today. But I remember in my days, the last day of school was just, you know, it was just bomb. So, what we would do... Um, we would take a white t-shirt to school and everybody would sign it. Everybody would just wish you a very uh, fun and cool summer. Come back next year. I hope to see you next year. And, you know, everybody would just sign it. All your classmates would just sign that. So um, Desi had her white shirt on. You know, everybody had signed it. And like I said, she was just out celebrating with her friend. So, you know, she, I think she had her curfew at 8.30. So she calls her grandmother. Her mom's out working. She worked up till late. So she calls her grandma up to her house and she asks if she could stay up with her friend for a little longer. Her grandmother says, okay, I'll let you come home at 10. I was working at Rockwell, like I said. Um, I didn't come, I didn't get home until 2. My mom met me at the door, which was, what was going on? She says, Desi's not home yet. I said, what? She says, Desi's not home yet, 2 a.m. And, and I says, w when did you talk to her? She says, she called at 8.30 and asked for a curfew extension because it was the last day of school. And she said, and mom said, I told her, I said, no, because when you come in, you're a little noisy and you wake everyone up. And she says, I promise, I promise, I won't be noisy. If I'm noisy, you won't have to let me come in late anymore, okay? And she goes, okay, but Sunday's going to be there at 10. She has the house key. You must be home at 10 so she can let you in. I will, I will, mom. I'll be home at 10. I'm, you know, Grandma, I will. So at, at uh, 9.30, she left where she was, which was off of rushing, and her and her girlfriend were walking home, so she would have made it plenty, she would have made it by 10. So they went into the Circle K there at Salem and Rushing, uh, and I don't know, got a drink, whatever, and then walked out, and at that point, uh, her girlfriend lived this way, and she lived up Salem this way. So they split at that point. Uh, and Desi went up towards where she lived, which was like two and a half blocks, maybe three at the most. And uh, the store clerk identified David Wood as being in the store and walking out behind them. So the girlfriend turned around to say goodbye, you know, and she saw David Wood's tan truck, a little small Toyota truck at that point, or some type of small truck. And they knew it because he used to go to the Veterans Park and hang out there and talk to the young girls. So I'm sure Desi knew him. Yeah, not knew him, knew him, but knew him. Yeah, he wasn't a complete stranger. And I can just hear the conversation, hey, you want me, you want to ride home? You know, Desi's thinking, oh, three blocks, you know, sure, why not? So he, she sees her get into David Wood's truck. And that was the last time he knew her.
Sorry. So as her mom described, the two of her, two of the girls were walking home from her other friend's house, and they were coming back. They were already going home. Like I said, her curfew was at ten, so she was already coming back around nine forty ish. They stopped at the Circle K, I guess, to grab some drinks or whatever, and you know. After they get out of the store, both go their separate ways. You know, one goes to the left, the other one goes to the right. Unfortunately, Desi was the one that was going the other direction, and she's the one that um, had this happen to her. And her mom, up to today, she remembers that last time she saw her, and those last words that she ever said to she starts to walk away and she turns around she waves goodbye she goes bye mom thanks a lot she goes love you i said love you too see you tonight and i thank god every day my last words to her was i love you her mom describes desiree as being just very affectionate very loving and she believed that there was good in everyone so, you know, she even asked her mom once that what a gullible meant. Her mom replied by saying, well, it means you believe everything people tells you all the time. She says, well, I was voted most gullible in class today. They believe he offered Desiree a ride home. This was, you know, the last time she was seen alive. So, like I said, she always was a very gullible person. She would always try to see the good in, in, in every person. So, you know, maybe she saw this man to be a very kind man, you know, a very good man, maybe. And she she said, okay, give me a ride. And she got in the car or the truck and left with him without knowing that she wasn't going to come back again. Sadly, on October 20th, 1987, Desiree's body was discovered in a shallow grave in a desert area along the Macomb Street, about five miles from her home. She was wearing the white t-shirt with her friend's signatures, one of the pieces that helped identify her body when her remains were found, along with dental records. After Desiree's body was found, three days later, we have a man who's been charged with a rape that occurred three months ago in the desert. So this woman said to be at the Circle K when this happened, and she was approached by David, okay? So he never said his real, his real name. I'm sorry, he never said that his name was David or anything. He actually said that his name was Skeeter. So, you know, he approached her and asked if she needed a ride home. She said yes. She got on his truck and they left. They eventually ended up at an apartment complex where David ran inside and then he came out with a rope hanging out of his pocket. David then proceeded to drive around to the desert. This man ordered this woman to get out of the vehicle. She saw David take out a blanket and a shovel from the back of the truck. He took the shovel and started digging a hole somewhere behind a bush and then he started to rip her clothes off. Before hearing what he believed were voices, I guess he was he was hearing some type of voices or something, I don't know. And um, for some reason he started to grab all of his things and then he ordered to he ordered her to get back into the truck and he he went to another spot. So he again ordered her to get out of the truck, placed the blanket on the ground, tied her tied her hands onto like a bush, gagged her, and then raped her. And David stated that he heard voices again, which was so freaking weird. I don't know what he was thinking or what he was going through, but yeah, he was hearing some type of voices. Then he just got up. He grabbed his things and left, leaving the girl in the desert naked. The woman reached out to the police and she took them to both places where he was digging and then the second place where he actually raped her and left her there. So police decided to follow up on the leads that the woman had provided 
police went to speak with area high school and middle school students to see if they knew anyone who matched the description of the attacker. And they all said, oh yeah, that is a guy. This guy is so weird. His name's Skeeter. So then they discovered his real name. But, you know, police started digging and stuff. And his real name came up to be David Leonard Wood. So then after they asked the victim, the girl that was left you know, at the desert to come to a photo lineup and see if she could actually recognize the man. As soon as they pulled up his picture on the lineup, she said, that's the one. That's the man that assaulted me. So she had no hesitation, like none whatsoever. The police even went back to the high school students and the middle school students to run those photo lineups of him and... They identified him. Like, as soon as they saw him, they identified him on the quicks. So then police arrested David Wood for the assault on the survival girl. They continued building up a case against him for the the four unsolved murders or the bodies that they had found since they all had some type of connection with him. You know, a search warrant was executed on his home and truck when they got there they saw that David was actually a little bit ahead of them and he was trying to cover up his tracks like hell no I'm not going to jail you know he knew what he was doing like come on you know what's good and what's wrong you're a very grown man uh, and you know what's good and what's bad he knew what he was doing and he decided to cover up his tracks he cleaned his truck spotless clean he actually vacuumed the the whole truck. He vacuumed the whole thing. He cleaned it. He washed it. I think he even uh, kind of like washed the seats of the truck because police said that whenever they went to like touch the seats and stuff, they were a little wet. They were a little like humid. So they can feel, they could see that he had just uh, cleaned up his whole mess, you know. So and police, you know... You might think that you're ahead of them, but you're not. So police had to actually think ahead of him now. And they seized the contents inside the vacuum. Okay, so they actually took everything that's inside that vacuum cleaner. Yep, all that dirt, all that, all that. They took it with them because they were going to analyze it. They also did find um, lots of pictures of little girls like lots, lots of pictures. They would open cabinets and drawers and stuff and they would find pictures of the little girls. That's how sick he was. So going back to the contents of the vacuum, they actually found orange fibers and those orange fibers were known to have been around, you know, where the bodies were found in the shallow graves and also in Desiree's body. In November, dogs led police to the remains of a fifth person in a shallow grave, and this was not far from where the other bodies were found. And in November of 1987, a search warrant was issued, and they issued the police to take hair, blood, semen, and saliva samples from David Wood. And in early December, they finally indicted him on the sexual assault that occurred on the desert and also indicted in two counts of aggravated In March of 1988, a sixth body was found in the same desert. And this grave was actually found by a couple collecting tin cans. And upon closer inspection, they found bones. The body was a few hundred yards from where the other bodies were found. So now David is being sentenced to 50 years in prison for raping this girl on the desert, the girl that survived, and he is sentenced to 50 years in prison. And in 1990, he was indicted on a serial murder charge in connection with the six deaths. The serial murder that was moved to Dallas after the deaths made national headlines. David was scheduled to die by lethal injection on August 20th, 2009, but he was granted a stay of execution just 24 hours prior to this, okay? How crazy is that? 
this stay was given as Wood and his lawyers filed an appeal. They were arguing that David suffered from mental retardation, uh, citing cruel and unusual punishment. A 2002 U.S. Supreme Court ruled barred any person suffering from mental retardation from being executed. So they were arguing that he was mentally retarded. And I actually don't buy that. I actually think that he knew what he was up to. He knew what he was doing. Like, I don't know. I just don't buy it. You tell me what you guys think. Um, but yeah, the appeal failed in 2014 after the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals ruled that David and his lawyers failed to show that he was mentally ill. A new execution date was never set. Wood and his lawyers began requesting additional DNA testing, claiming that it wouldn't be him, the one that actually committed the crimes. They actually said that if they did a DNA test and they would su submit another, um, I'm sorry, if they would submit this man's David DNA test, um, it would come out that it wasn't him, that it was actually some other man that murdered this young girl's okay like how stupid is that anyway the request is still pending and david wood now is 63 and he remains in death row and is being held at the allen b polunsky i think i'm pronouncing that i'm not gonna butcher it but i'll leave it somewhere here unit state prison in livingston texas so um okay you guys i mean how can he say that it wasn't him. How can he deny everything uh, that actually connects him to all these crimes, that actually connects him to the murders? The, I mean, come on, there's been witnesses that saw him with the girls. So one of the bodies was Ivy Williams. I believe she was 23. And a co-worker said they saw her with David Wood the night that she disappeared. She was stabbed in the face, you guys. Multiple stabs in the face. So, so I'm actually going to read to you the bodies that were recovered. The bodies that were found. Like I said, only six bodies were recovered because three of the other bodies, even though they were in connection with him, have never been found. So the first one that they found was Rosa Maria Casio. Uh, she was a waitress and a topless dancer. She was reported missing September 4th, 1987. She was from Addison, Texas. She came to visit her sister in Juarez, Mexico. She came to El Paso to buy postage stamps. She last, she was last seen with a man who fit the description of David L. Wood. She was the only victim who they had enough evidence that they were able to rule the cause of death and the cause of death of her was strangulation so the second victim was karen baker she was a mom of three a four-year-old son a three-year-old daughter and a one-year-old daughter she was reported missing june the 5th 1987 her remains were found in september 4th 1987 she wanted to turn her life around and went to cosmetology school. She was last seen leaving the Hawaiian Royal Motel on Dyer Street. She left with a man witnessed to be David Wood. A motel employee says she was with him. She was going on a date with this David man and was not seen ever again. The third uh, victim, as you guys know, is Desiree Wheatley, 15. She was reported missing on June the 2nd, 1987. Her remains were found on October 20th, 1987. And as you guys know, she was a sweetheart and she was a middle school student. The fourth victim was Don Marie Smith. She was 14, you guys. She was, reporting, she was reported missing in September the 10th, 87, and her remains found were on October 20th, 1987. She was last seen by her friends in August 1987. She was last heard of when she called her mom to tell her she was okay and that she was not coming home. 
So she went to Parkland High School. She also was a, I'm sorry, a school dropout. I'm so sorry. And she ran away from home. She was just a constant runaway. Like, I guess her family was used to, she would come home and then she wouldn't. She would come home. She would shower, um, get another, you know, change her clothes and stuff. And then she would leave. She was found near a shallow grave near Desiree Whitley. So remember those first two graves they found. And those were from the first two girls that I just told you. And then the next two that were found in October. That was Desiree and um, what was her name? Don Marie. So then this is the six... Um, this is a sixth victim, and this is Angelica Frausto, which she was 17. She was reported missing in September the 6th, 1987. Her remains were found November the 3rd, 1987. She dropped out of middle school and enrolled in a school for kids with behavioral problems. She also worked as a dancer at the Red Flame Bar on Dyer Street. She had been running away from home from the age of 12. She was last seen with David Wood on his motorcycle, last seen on June the 3rd of 1987. Worst part is that the investigators confirmed that she was buried alive. I don't know how true this is, you guys. Um, I heard, I was reading this article, and um, supposedly the investigators confirmed this, which is so sad. Um, and the last one... I'm sorry, the last one was the fifth um, victim, and this is the sixth victim. This is Ivy Williams, age 23, and she was last seen in spring of 1987. Her remains were found in March of March 14th in 1987. She was a topless dancer who had a history of being a sex worker. She was also an addict, and she loved motorcycles. A co-worker said that uh, she saw her with David Wood the night she disappeared. She was the one that was stabbed in the face. The one that had multiple stabs in the face, you guys. So, like I said, and I repeat millions of times, you guys, there are three girls missing still. Three girls that have not been found. Three families that have not had closure. Three families that are still waiting for their daughters. Three families that are still looking for their daughters. It is so sad. So, David comes and tells everybody that he is innocent. He's innocent of these crimes. He's innocent of these murders. I mean, you're telling me that nine girls had connection with you. Nine girls you spoke to. Nine girls were last seen with you. Nine girls... And you're innocent? How is that? I want to know how is that. Because honestly, you guys, it doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. If he says that, that he's innocent, it doesn't make sense. He's been, um, you know, persecuted for three other charges. The one, the ones that took place in 1970-something and the one that took place in the desert, exactly where the other bodies were found. How are you innocent of that? You know, it just makes me so mad, you guys, that there are just sick and twisted people out there. And you cannot be gullible. You cannot trust anyone. But yeah, I'll keep you guys posted on this case. Like I said, he's still sitting on death row. So we don't know what's up. We don't know if, you know, we don't know what's up yet. But I will keep you guys posted to see what happens. And we'll see. But yeah, you guys. Anyway, that is the story of today's sick, twisted ass. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to keep filing my nails here. You know, I've already played everything. All the acrylic and stuff. Um, the blue and the milky white. You can go find them on my online store. I do have a new online store where you can go and purchase my new products. So I will have the link to that on my on my description box. And for my old products, which are $5 right now, you can go and purchase them on my Etsy shop, with, which will be there linked as well. So yeah, you guys, I'm just going to buff out 
everything I'm gonna clean uh, after that because we do not want any dust on our nails so just make sure you clean I always clean them with a lint free wipe and a lot of alcohol <laughs> and then I'm gonna I'm gonna go in with my top coat so in this case I'm gonna be making matte and shiny so the blue are gonna be matte and then the rest of the nails are gonna be shiny so for my shiny top coat I'm using my Zoef top coat and for my shiny top coat I'm gonna be using the Zoef one but the shiny one so again shiny and matte which I always like that combination I don't know what the heck is wrong with me but I just like that combination of matte and shiny so that's what I did I cured that in the lamp and then I place it there for about 60 seconds once it comes out of the lamp this is what the nails look like I didn't want to add you know any crystals or anything because I was gonna add a pom-pom so these pom-poms will soon be available on my on my online store soon you guys hopefully so soon I'm waiting for them <laughs> so they will be available I will of course mention to you guys when and then you know I like that the magnet part is not huge like the other ones it is pretty tiny so whenever you have to wash your hands or shower, you know, or wash dishes, whatever the case may be, you just remove that, do whatever you need to do, and then you can put your little pom-pom back on. So it's it's just super cute. So again, I didn't want to add any crystals because the big huge pom-pom is there on the way. So yeah, you guys, and this is what the nails look like. Don't forget to add your cuticle oil and this is it you guys thank you so much for being here again i really hope you enjoyed today's story which is nothing enjoyable when you're going through it this is more of like an informational video for you guys to know and find out more of this this man if he's able to be called a man but yeah you guys thank you so much for being here i will see you on the next one stay safe god bless and bye bye